So let's see where we are with series. So far, the tests we have are the limit test for divergence. We check does the limit of a sub n go to 0. If not, then diverges. We have a geometric series test. You look at your series. If it's a geometric series, then we have a test by looking to see what the value of r is. We have our integral test. And then from the integral test, we have the p-series test. So these are going to be the tests for all the special cases. What we're going to do now is consider comparison tests, which let us compare series that don't look like these to series that do look like these. And this is pretty much going to get us almost everything we'll see in the wild. So let's take a look at what the comparison tests are going to do for us. So my first comparison test, we call it the direct comparison test. What we're going to have, we have two sequences, a sub n and b sub n. And we're going to consider the series that goes with both of these. So let's check our first statement. If the series for b sub n converges, then the series for a sub n will also converge. If the series for a sub n diverges, then the series for b sub n is going to diverge. A couple catches that occur when we try to use this test. Well, one is going to be you need to deal with inequalities, and inequalities always make everyone feel a little uncomfortable. We'll try to clear that up a little bit as best we can. The other one is, to use this test correctly, you have to be able to choose your a sub n or b sub n right, or the test isn't going to work. Or you may need to root around for an answer which isn't so obvious. Okay, let's take a look at an example, and then we'll take a look at why this is true. I'm going to try n equals 0 to infinity, sum 1 over n squared plus n plus 1. So the trick you have to do with these is try to squint and try to find the terms in your sequence that are going to grow the fastest. That's usually what gives away what you're going to compare to. So if I squint at this long enough, this is really going to look a lot like the series for 1 over n squared. 1 over n squared is going to converge by the p-test with p equal to 2. So if I set up my inequality correctly, I'll get that the summation of this series is going to converge by the direct comparison test. So here, my a sub n is going to be this series, this sequence on the inside, and my b is going to be 1 over n squared. So somehow I have to show that 0 is less than or equal to 1 over n squared plus n plus 1, and then that's going to be less than or equal to 1 over n squared. So how do you deal with the inequalities? Well, the rule is you start backwards with what you want to wind up with, and then work your way to the front, and then when you write it up, you do everything in reverse order. So let's take a look. So what I would do is, I take a look and I say, I want to show that this inequality here is true. So my next step is going to be to clear out the denominators, because I can't work with this thing as fractions. So I'm going to multiply both sides by n squared, n squared plus n plus 1, to clear out the denominators. That's going to have the effect of just switching things to the other side. Now here, what can I do next? Well, I can get rid of the n squareds, and that's going to leave me with 0 less than n plus 1. Okay, and there's no work there to show that that's true. Since we're dealing with a series starting at 0, we're asking, well, I'm taking a number n, which is bigger than or equal to 0 and adding 1 to it. Is that always bigger than 0? Definitely. Now, when you go write it up, this is how you say it. Well, since my n is bigger than or equal to 1, I have 0 less than n plus 1. We're going to add n squared to both sides, which will give me n squared less than n squared plus n plus 1. And then I'm just going to divide both sides by n squared times n squared plus n plus 1. That's going to give me my inequality, and then I have 0 less than or equal to a sub n. It's less than or equal to our b sub n. And then I get my statement of convergence by the p-test. So now let's look at an example with divergence. So we'll consider n going from 0 to infinity, 1 over n to the 1 third plus 6. We squint at this. This looks like the series for 1 over n to the 1 third. 
This is going to diverge by the p test with p equal to one third. Okay, our p here is between zero and one with one inclusive. So I want to show that this diverges. So that's going to mean when I want divergence, this is going to be the sequence on the outside of my inequality, zero less than or equal to a, less than or equal to bn. And so the an is going to be the one that I choose. So here we're going to choose one over n to the one third. And then we want to follow our nose and see if this inequality is going to hold for these sequences. So let's see what happens when we work backwards. Well, we're going to clear the denominators by multiplying both sides by n to the one third, n to the one third plus six. That gives me n to the one third plus six, less than or equal to n to the one third. Subtract the n to the one third from both sides, and we notice we wind up with six less than or equal to zero, and that's definitely false. So my original choice of n to the one third probably is not going to be the best one for doing this with the direct comparison test. Okay, well, you need a little bit of experience to get good at guessing these. So I'm going to go with b sub n equal to one over n plus six. Now, by the integral test, we notice if I take the integral, improper integral from whatever to infinity of dx over x plus six, well, the antiderivative of one over x plus six is natural log of x plus six. And as we let x go out to infinity, that's also going to go out to plus infinity. So this says, by the integral test, that one over n plus six definitely diverges. So what are we going to do then? Well, now I'm going to repeat the same thing here, where I have the n to the one third, I'm going to do it with my n plus six, and then we'll see what happens. So how are we going to start this off? Well, we'll notice n is bigger than or equal to one, n to the one third is less than or equal to n. The way we see that is, if you draw the picture, okay, well n to the one third looks like this, and then n looks like that. Okay, so this is really x, x to the one third, and they're gonna meet at one. So by looking at the graph, this first equality that I'm writing down here is definitely true. All right. So let's see how we would write this. Okay, so I'll assume we've already done all our work backwards. So we start off with the statement for n bigger than or equal to one, n to the one third is less than or equal to n. And we only need to say that once. So it adds six to both sides. And then I can divide both sides by n to the one third plus six times n plus six. And so that's gonna have the effect of just switching each thing to the bottom on the other side. And both of these are definitely going to be bigger than zero because we're using n bigger than one. So these are always going to be positive numbers. So that gives me the inequality, zero less than or equal to one over n plus six, less than or equal to one over n to the one third plus six. So that's going to be my zero, my a n, and my b n. The a n, the series for that's going to diverge. So that's going to force my series for b n to also diverge. So that means this is going to be a divergent series, as we would have guessed if we had squinted and went with the one over n to the one third. All right, maybe a little worried about this, but fortunately, direct comparison test, you really don't use that one in practice that often. What is really important for is to prove the test that we really do use all the time in practice, and that's going to be the limit comparison test, and that'll be coming up. So why is the direct comparison test true? Let's draw some pictures and check it out. So remember we're starting with zero is less than or equal to a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n. I'm gonna draw the picture for this. So remember a sub n is the area of the rectangle with base one height a sub n. Since these are all positive numbers here, we're gonna have rectangles above the x-axis so my a sub n goes like this, and then if I want the rectangle with height b sub n, that has to be above the a1 rectangle, say in this case. So as I draw in all of my sequence rectangles for a2, a3, a4, and so on, the b's are always gonna be above the a's. Now, let's think in terms of partial sums. So what this is gonna mean is, 
If I take the partial sum, the nth partial sum for a, which I'll call s sub n raised to the a, that's going to mean if I go out n terms and sum up the area of these rectangles, well, since these rectangles are all under the b rectangles, the partial sum for b has to be bigger than the partial sum for a. So this is going to drive everything I do from here on out. All right, let's see. Okay, also note, my partial sums are always also positive numbers because they're going to be sums of positive numbers. So that's also going to be useful. Now let's take a look. Because my A's and B's are always positive, that means the sequences associated with S sub N A and S sub N B are going to be monotonically increasing. Why is that? Take, for instance, S sub N A. The way I get the next term in the sequence, that would be take S sub N minus 1A, and then how do I get to the next term? I'm going to add A sub N, which is a positive number. So I get to this one from this one by increasing by A sub N, and so on and so on. I keep going to the next term by adding another positive number. So monotonic increasing on my S sub Ns. All right. That's ironed out. Let's do some assumptions. So let's assume the series for B sub n converges. We'll call the sum S. Now, since S sub n for B is monotonic increasing, that means that this sequence here, all the elements in it, have to be less than or equal to S. If I'm increasing and I'm going to a limit, once I get to that limit, I can't go above it and then come back down or I have to decrease again at some point. So we're going to have S sub n b always less than or equal to s. OK, but punchline, well, we just showed that S sub n a is less than or equal to S sub n b. So that also means that S sub n a is going to be less than or equal to s. We also have that S sub n a is always positive. So what we've just shown is that S sub n a is bounded. It's bounded between 0 and s. Now I can pull out my monotone convergence theorem, which is going to say, if I have a sequence which is bounded, in this case it's monotonic increasing, I put these two together and that's going to mean that my sequence, S sub n a, is going to converge somewhere. The theorem doesn't tell us what number it actually converges to, it just tells us that it converges. Now, if S sub n a converges, that's the definition of convergence for the series. Okay, you check your partial sums, if that sequence converges, then we say the series converges. So that shows convergence of B series, shows the convergence for the series for A. Let's do divergence. A little bit sloppier, but it'll be the same idea. So to suppose series for A sub n diverges. So that's going to be the one that's in the middle. Okay, and we think of this as if this area goes off to infinity, it has to push the area for this off to infinity with it. We're going to use our increasing fact again. Since S sub n a is increasing, well, if it's increasing and it's divergent, it can't oscillate or do anything crazy. It's just going to shoot right up to plus infinity. Now, I have S sub n a is less than or equal to S sub n b. So that means if S sub n a is shooting off to plus infinity, it's going to have to push all of my S sub n b's off to plus infinity also. So that's going to be the definition of the series for b sub n diverging. So that shows my other statement. If the series for A sub n diverges, then the series for B sub n is going to diverge with it. 